So today we're going to uh, the Torah portion. Good evening, uh, good morning, everyone. Shabbat shalom. We are uh, going to talk about the Torah portion Bar, Bar Midbar, which is the starting of the the book of Numbers. And we're since uh, tonight is Shavuot, the feast of weeks. We're gonna touch a little. We're gonna spend more time, a little bit more time in uh, in talking about the feast of weeks because this is the most misunderstood feast, and yet. Say that, and yet, and yet. With, with, with passion, and yet, and yet, it is the most important, and we're going to see why. Amen? So um, if you go to the next slide, so we are a Messianic congregation. So if you want to join the live Zoom, uh, those are the Zoom uh, um, credentials, and we start at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or Toronto time, if you are somewhere all over the world. And you can also visit our website. So if you go to the first slide, so the book of Numbers, it's interesting the, in, in Hebrew, the way they, 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 they call the chapters or the, the books is by the first uh, phrases of the book. Like for example, if you recall, Genesis is called Bereshit in English in the beginning. The next book was Exodus or in Hebrew, if they call it Shemot or these are the names. Leviticus, which, which, which they call Vayikra, and he called, and today numbered, they call it Bar Midbar, which is in the wilderness or in the desert. And finally, the last Torah book is called Deuteronomy, which is uh, in Hebrew, in Devarim, meaning the word. So if you, if you put those together, prophetically, if you put that together, it, the Hebrew, it says, the, the whole Torah is can be summarized by this. It says, "In the beginning, say that in the beginning. In the beginning, these are the names yeah. he called out in the wilderness. Yeah. Why? Yeah. To give his word. Yeah. Say, wow, yeah. 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 wow. Yeah. So that's why we'll see here that the 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 the, 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 the piece of shovel is very." Pinnacle. It's the pinnacle. It's the heart of the Torah. Say that it's the heart of the Torah. Yeah, the of when the, you know, uh, the giving of the words, the words, instruction, the Torah. So, so we, the 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 go to next side. So the, the the Torah portion, of course, they are the book of Numbers was written on the second year they were in the wilderness. So they had their second Passover. So the first Passover was in Egypt. Now this is the first Passover outside of Egypt. So God gave them a new calendar. So they said they establish a Nisan as the first month. The third month, they received the 10 words at Mount Sinai. The fourth month, the sin of the golden calf. And then on the sixth month, what happened? Moses returned uh, for another 40 days. And he returns on the seventh day of the seventh month, which is uh, Yom, Kippur, Yom Kippur, the third, 10th day. And then they started the building of the tabernacle. Now they are in year two. So the book of Numbers is being written. Passover is being celebrated in the wilderness. They begin to organize the men by tribes for war already. And then the quail, the quail incidents, and then the, the, the spies, the, the, the spies and the evil report, and then they end up 38 more years in the wilderness. Okay, so that's a very uh, snapshot. So the book of Numbers, you see, the book of Numbers starts out with a census. But before that, we, we uh, was interesting what uh, Sister Raman read regarding Hosea. If you read the book of Hosea chapter 2, it talks about there was this wife that was unfaithful. And, uh, you know, and the husband <coughs> just allowed her to be. And then, then she finally realized that her life was better off with her former husband. So she begins to realize this. So, so here God is saying in Hosea chapter two, he said, behold, therefore I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness. So he's talking about Israel. Here. Israel, they were, they were in Egypt, they got lost. They were there, God saved them. Joseph was there, Joseph brought them. So the children of Israel, they became part of, instead of them influencing the world, they became part of the world. And God said, okay, now I'm going to take you out. So he said, he, he called them out of 
the wilderness. Uh, called, him, called him them out of Egypt. They called them out of the world. And what did he do? He called them in verse 18 and he says, there will be a day, the Lord says, you shall call me Ishi. Say that Ishi. It means my husband. No longer shall you call me master. So, so God is saying, you know, this, that's why the, the Feast of Shavuot is very important. Why? Because it really culminates, you know, that's, uh, we're going to see here the importance of the, the Feast of Shavuot. And yet, even the Pentecostals are not celebrating it. Can you believe that? There's a the uh, Pentecostals. They're not even, they don't even understand it. But today, we're going to learn about it. Amen? Why it's a very important feast. It's a very important feast. Go on next slide, Jesse. So the counting. So here the, in, in the writing, so it's interesting because the book of Bad Midbar in, in the Greek, it's it's uh, it's called numbers. It's it's a, it's a good name description because you know, really there were several census taken. They were they were numbered in the beginning and they were numbered in the end. And uh, and we're, we're going to understand why why the census. But in uh, it's it, it, but again, Bar Midbar starts out with a census of the entire nation. So back in Exodus and Leviticus, they saw the details about the priesthood and the Mishkan, which covers half of those books. Now Bar Midbar speaks about the counting. Why is it important? Why? Because remember, they are they, God is preparing them to the Promised Land. In other words, it's like they were being marked. See that I like they were being marked. Wow. Say wow. wow. So just before they enter the promised land, they are going, they are being marked. Say that they're being marked. Yeah. So the same thing, let's see, there's a pattern in prophecy, right? So the same thing, God will mark each one of us. Amen. Wow. He's gonna mark us because he's preparing us where. Wow. Say wow. wow. So um In, uh, in, 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 in the book of Bad Midbar, what's interesting that uh, there was actually uh, the two counting that happened. There was the counting that happened just be after they sinned, the sin of the golden calf, which is, uh, which is uh, not recorded in the Torah. And then this is the, the second time it was counted in the month of Ayar. So in the month of Ayar, just before Nisan, the God made them do another census. The, the first census that was done, it's recorded in the, in only in their oral Torah or tradition. It says, in Bar Midbar, God called a census counting the Jewish people, the generation that left Mitzrayim or Egypt towards the end, the new generation is counted again. But the total, so you will see it, it's almost the same numbers. Uh, they, according to the writing, it, I, I tried to calculate it, but I didn't have time, but they said, that the numbers from the beginning and the end is the same, the total, but the, between the tribes, there were some changes. Of course, the, the tribe of Judah grew bigger. And why is that? Because the, prophetically, the, the tribe of Judah will be the biggest. Why? Because we will all enter yeah. to Judah, amen? <laughs> Judah needs a lot, the, the, all, a lot of the Gentile nations will be coming to Judah, amen? The, the Gentiles that have grafted themselves to Israel will enter the gates. Remember, the kingdom of God is, is, is divided into 12 gates, which are the 12 tribes. And he entered to Judah. So Judah, even, even uh, during the time of Moses, Judah was the biggest tribe. It's always been the biggest tribe. Amen? So when, when, when the Jewish people, the first census, they counted uh, in Rosh Kodesh Ayar, beginning the second year, the year change in Nisan, as we know. So if you recall, the Mishkan was dedicated on which month? They dedicated the Mishkan on the month of Nisan. So in, in Jewish, in Jewish uh, thought, the fiscal year of Israel is Nisan, the start of the year. That's why uh, on Ayar, they started counting. Ayar is the month before Nisan, right? So the month before Ayar, they started counting. Why? Because the temple tax is for the is for the, the new fiscal year. So they, they, they start collecting at the, the end of the year for the beginning of the year. So all the monies for the temple is being collected ahead of time. Are you still with me? Okay. So so here God made a uh, 
that one month after the dedication of the mission, Jewish people were counted. Not all was counted, of course. Only men age 20 and above were counted. So they had they counted about 603,000 men. Of course, the Levites were not counted at this time. Again, uh, uh, Rashi, one of the uh, ancient commentators, said, as there was an un, uh, there was an unrecorded census of the Jewish people that took place earlier, after Yom Kippur. In other words, after the sin of the golden calf, remember when Moses came down, God said to Moses, "I want you to start a building project. I'm going to live among you." So they start, they started collecting half shekel, and if you re, if you recall, the half shekel was used for the foundation of the tabernacle, for the curtain, so that a lot of the silver shekels were used all around the tabernacle. Again, symbolic of, silver is symbolic of what? Redemption, there you go. So redemption. So here, they, they, in, the, in, the, in their oral tradition, they said that there was a first census that happened on Yom Kippur. So, uh, uh, but the, what's interesting, why would God do another census six about five or six months later and the numbers did that change it, it was exactly the same number so the question is during the six months was there not a birthday was there not somebody who died so how come the number was the same so 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 they, the, the, the the jewish writers were bought the rabbis were baffled. how come the number because when they when they when they calculated the weight of the shekel and so it came out to be 603,000, whatever. And then when they did the census, uh, the, second, the second census, it was the same number. So they're saying, so between, for six months, there was no birthday. Nobody turned 90 or 20. Nobody died. So the, the explanation was, they said, okay, the reason why there was nobody changed date, nobody grew older, because they said that just like the Chinese, they count their birthday on the new year. So uh, like Rosh Hashanah, every Rosh Hashanah you go, you 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 you, you go one one age. So there was no there was no Rosh Hashanah during Yom Kippur and uh, and uh, Shivan. So therefore, there was no birthday. Nobody grew older. I, so it, that's their that's their explanation, right? So, but nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, the point is the number did not change. So then the question is, why did God count again? If the number did not change, I think I have another slide here. If the number did not change, then why did God have to count it again, right? Is that a good question? Yes. Why? It's because, so if you can imagine, if you can imagine a jeweler, do you know a jeweler? A good one? Next time we introduce it to my son because he, has, he bought an engagement. Anyway, a jeweler, you know, he, has, he owns precious stones. Right? Diamonds. And diamonds, precious stones. And if you are a jeweler and you like jewelry, you know, you would you would you would get you would open your vault and, and you would you would count you would you would uh, count your you you would uh, count your jewels almost every night. Why? Is it because you know you you're, you're, you think somebody's stealing your jewelry? No, it's because he's so fond of his jewelry or his his precious stones that he likes to see them, right? The same way, if you use that an analogy, it's like God, you know, he's so fond of each and every one of us that he wants to, to account for each one. Oh, how's my son Peter doing? How's my, my daughter uh, 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 Lucia doing? So he wants to account for each one of us, amen? amen. He counts the stars by name, amen? amen. He counts his servants, his, his sons, and daughters by name. Amen. So God enjoys remembering us. Amen. Just like this little child, he has his precious money in the piggy bank. And then she would open it every day to, 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 to see all her precious coins. Not that somebody's stealing. He's not concerned about it. He was, just wants to, to enjoy seeing all the money that she has. Amen. So, so that's the, that's the uh, a simple explanation. The multiple counting, what, what's the purpose? Rashi explains multiple counting by Almighty God, although he knows us, it's an expression of his affection. Say that affection. affection. So 
Let's take a little bit deeper, go to the next part. So let's take it a little bit deeper, right? So here in the second census, it says there, although the population base was, was, did not change, the way the counting happened on the first census, the first census was more indirect, meaning Moses had a basket or had a, had a collection box and people would just drop the coins, the church half shekel. And by the time they counted it, uh, you, you, you can also see the integrity of the Jewish people at the time. So it came out the same number, meaning people were honest enough to, because it was anonymous. Nobody knew if you dropped your silver pointer or not. But at the end of the day, when they counted it, it was exactly the same number as on the second census. So the first census was very indirect. It was anonymous. People dropped half shekel in a container and Moses and Aaron counted the half shekel. And by then they would be able to determine the population. There was no, I mean, no, there was no individual contact between the donor and the counter. So the first census was very uh, anonymous. Okay, I say with me. Now, the, in contrast, in Numbers chapter one, where Peter read, he said there, Take the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel by their families. Now, they have to be identified not only by their families. In other words, when the first census, they didn't care which tribe gave the money. Now, it says it has to be identified by their families, by their father's house, according to the number of names. Say the names yeah. of every male on their so here, the difference, the second sense of what happened is each one had to come to Moses and introduce himself. Hey, Moses, by the way, my name is Alfie. Remember that, okay? <laughs> so, so it was very personal. Everyone had to come and meet Moses. Okay, I see with me. And then they had to identify which tribe they are. So they had to account for not only who they were, what tribe, who's your father, what tribe you are. So the, the, in contrast, the second census was very different. In, it was not a simply an aggregate number, but they had to identify themselves as whether you're from Reuben, Reubenites, Simonites, Judeites, whatever. So each one had to identify themselves. There was a physical encounter that was important for Moses because Every individual Jew, every individual believer, leadership is not only about the collective. You know, that's why, you know, in, in big companies, the president would, would visit the different, different location and introduce himself and they would have a town hall and, and the president will mingle with the employees. Why? Because they need, he needed to know who, this, who, who these people are working for him. Right? Mm -hmm. It's important. It's, it's not just a PR, PR ploy, but the... the, the the organization needs to know who are the men and women behind the success or the failure of the government, right? So it's important. So in Moses' case, God said, okay, Moses, you need to meet all the people. So there was a, there was the second, so the first was anonymous and collective, collective. The second was individualistic and personal and tribal. So what is the, what is the significance? Why am I explaining this to you guys? <laughs> Next slide. So, so, so what? So here, there's the concept of the melting pot and the salad bowl. Okay. So the concept of the melting pot is just like uh, uh, you know, in uh, in in many societies, you know, like uh, if you if you want to uh, live in their country, you have to learn their language, right? So mm -hmm. you have to you have to assist, you have to you have to. Uh, uh, there's no requirement for a, a second language. Like uh, in Canada, you know, French or English, right? You can, you know, there's no requirement to speak Spanish or anything like that. So, so there's, uh, so you, you, it requires uh, sometimes in a melting pot concept, there is a, a, a idea of homo homogenation that is represented by the first census. The first census was the melting pot concept did not care if you were a Reubenite or a Danite, a Judite. All they care about was Am Israel, the nation of Israel. While on the second census, 
it represents a different vision of the community, meaning we call it a salad bowl. What is a salad bowl? The salad bowl is a beautiful uh, tray of, of salad. Uh, the, the, the beauty of the salad lies precisely by the different texture, by the different colors, by the different crunch of the salad, the sweetness of the potato or tomato or potato. The beauty is not on the sameness. Can you imagine a salad bowl with all lettuce? That's not a salad bowl. Yeah. That's a bowl of lettuce, right? right? So the distinction is the one that is celebrated rather than uh, the distinction and difference. And every one of, of, of the component is, di is different and creates beauty. And that would otherwise would not exist. You, uh, you can use many examples, like for example, a, a rose a garden, right? You have to have a variety of plants. If it's all daisy, or all rose, as long as it's different color, it's good. But you need a variety so that the beauty will be enhanced. Amen, are you still with me? So, but the, the, the common denominator there is, is you're putting together different elements and each element of the diversity is in the context of the unity. So in Ephesians chapter four, it actually describes it beautifully. It says here, verse 14, we, we will then no longer be infants tossed about by the waves and blown along by every wind of teaching at the mercy of people clever in devising ways to deceive. Verse, mm -hmm. verse 15, instead, say that instead, instead. Yeah. Speaking the truth in love, yeah. we will in every respect grow up unto him who is the head, the Messiah. Under his control, the whole body is being fitted together, held together to support every joint and every part working to fulfill its function. This is how the body grows and builds itself in love. So, so what is what uh, what Paul is saying, what, what the Torah is saying, is you know, the, the whole idea of the kingdom of God is. It's, it's, it's tribal, you know, all the tribes come, contribute, all the different talents. It's, it's all part and what, what holds us together, you know what holds us together? Say that, what holds us together? Is the Torah, the truth, the word of God, amen? That's the one that holds us together. And, and, and if no matter what your culture is, no matter what part of the world you, you belong to, you know, uh, the, the, the thing that will unite us is the word of God. And that is, and that is what, what uh, the Torah is telling us today. And this is what Ephesians is saying. Diversity within the acceptable parameters of the Torah. We're not talking about legitimizing something that the Torah said is not uh, is forbidden, right? Is, uh, is uh, what do you call that? The word that is abomination. We're not talking about that. But we celebrate the idea of the difference, right? The difference, we, we celebrate our differences. You know, we come from different cultures. We come from different nations. But we can agree together because of the truth of the word of God. That's why it's important, you know, the, the salad bowl is, a, is a, uh, a beautiful picture of the different tapestry, the different uh, strengths and weakness that we, we all come together. And when we all come together, just like, you know, like like a like a symphony, you can use a you can use an orchestra, you can use many symbolism. Uh, when when the different instruments come together, when there was when they follow the what, when they follow this guy, what is the guy doing? The conductor. When he, when you follow the conductor, the music becomes beautiful. But when somebody just wants to do his own thing, and not following. Yeah. When we when we don't follow the word of God, what happened? Noise. Noise. We are alive will be a, a clanging symbol. Say that a clanging symbol. Yeah. We're just gonna be noise. Amen. Yeah. So the, so so here, so so what God is saying to us that the answer there, there is a time and place to become a melting pot, and there's a time and place to be a salad bowl. So remember after the Holocaust, when the, when there was a lot of uh, tragedy. The children of Israel became one. They became one. They became a melting pot. Everybody came together. It doesn't matter what drums you. You cannot. You cannot. It was not a time to be an individual at that time. 
You're going to say, you know what? I, I'm only concerned about what happened to me and my family. No, they had to come together. Why? Because they were in the middle of a crisis. They had to come together and, and we build a nation. So there's a time for a melting pot. Yes, a melting pot is good. But then God said, my, my long-term plan is for you to be a salad bowl. Amen. To be a salad bowl, right? Why? Because, because there is beauty in, in God's kingdom. That's why God said, okay, in the second census, I want every tribe identified. If you go to the next slide, yes, you see here that even the tribes, they live in a specific place, right? They were in a specific side of the tabernacle. Yes, amen? There was, uh, you know, so it's, it's, a melt, it's, it's a temporary response. The ultimate way we can create a community, a kingdom, where God's glory will come down is not the melting pot, meaning, you know, you don't have any opinion. You don't have any say. But God said, I want you to be a solid bowl. If you're a solid bowl, then the glory of God will come. Why? Because there is beauty in diversity in how we, we express the love of God. You know, there was this woman, it's a joke. She was being interviewed. She said, I don't believe in uh, organized religion. So she said, I organized my own religion. <laughs> Her name was Sheila. And she called herself. So she said, I am Sheilaism. I created my own religion. My name is Sheilaism. And the joke was, it's a good thing. Her name was not Judy because she will become Judaism. <laughs> I know it's not funny, but so the truth, <laughs> in truth, to be a part of God's movement, there's an amount, there's, there's a tremendous amount of conformity to it. Amen? Yeah, we can be diverse, but then we have to follow the Torah, right? Okay, we, 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 uh, we meet on Shabbat, we, we follow the feast, so there's, there's things that we do together, amen? Maybe we express it differently. Maybe some, you know, when there's a Shabbat service, it's more serious than ours, right? But, you know, the whole point is, we are connected. See, we are connected by the Torah, right? Um, so, you know, so, so what God is saying, often we, 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 we look or judge others because they're different from us. But God is saying maybe, the, maybe you know, we, we should look beyond the, we should look beyond the, uh, the, the, the religious barrier. And maybe we see, we begin to respect people. Uh, well, why? Because maybe they're not, you know, they're not openly religious, but maybe they have a better control over their anger. Maybe this person has, uh, respects their parents more. So in other words, what, what, what uh, even Yeshua was describing in Matthew 23, 23, he said there, who do you hypocrites? Torah teachers and Pirishim. You pay tithes and mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected, say that neglected, neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, which is justice, mercy, trust. These are the things that you should have attended to without neglecting others. So, so here, you know, we're being reminded that sometimes we, you know, we, yes, we, we are, uh, we, you know, God gave us the Torah now. We are, we are steps ahead of many people, but it doesn't mean that we are better than them. So God is reminding us, you know, we need to, to, to understand that this is not, uh, this is more than, there's more things that the Torah is teaching us. Amen? Amen? The fundamental lesson is, of the second census is, that the Shekinah glory of Hashem does not come by homogenation. In other words, people uh, you see communities today, especially in the religious community, that if the rabbi wears a big hat, everybody wears a big hat. Mm -hmm. If the rabbi wears long pants, everybody wears long pants. If he wears rubber shoes, everybody will wear rubber shoes. So there's no individualism, right? So you, you see, oh, by looking at them, oh, this guy follows this rabbi, right? Yeah, so yeah. why? Because there's so much homogeneation, right? And God said, for my glory to come, you need diversity, <laughs> diversity of expression, 
as long as it's following the framework of the Torah. Remember, we're not saying outside of outside of the norm, right? Like for example, or whatever. I know. Okay. But well, what I'm saying is, as long as we follow the word of God, you know, there's there's different ways we can express it, and that's important. So the, so going back, a person who's not learned in Torah, maybe he's not learned now, but God said, you know, uh, there is something that I can tap into his life that will bring him back to me. Amen? Amen. So the tribes in the camp of Israel, you might wonder how much, how big, a big deal about the tribes is, the, is, is another factor that creates this unity, isn't it? We should have a Jewish people who cares about the Reubenites, the Levites. Why should that factor in relevant even today? Why? Because God, like I said, God is specifically saying to the tribal division that not everyone is supposed to be the same. The tribal division shows different paths, different mechanism in the service of Hashem. And therefore, God wants that diversity. The fact that God values our effort more than the result. See, that's it. God values what we, we try to do, right? He doesn't care whether you, you know, you are a very successful business person. As long as you're honest. Are you still with me? He's not interested that, hey, you know, you, you need to, to live in a certain community. No. God is interested in the efforts. Amen. That we do. He doesn't care about the result. Because as long as you follow the framework, stay within God's bound, then God will be pleased. So here we, we we're, we're we're echoing. We we just we, we just completed the the, the 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 Shakira Omer, the counting of the Omer. As we finish the counting of, of the Omer, which was last night. So between Pesach and Shavuot, one of the purpose of the, of the counting of the Omer is to link the holiday of freedom, which was Pesach, with the holiday of responsibility. Say that. Holiday of responsibility. Holiday of responsibility. Remember, God gave us from, he set us free, and we're going to see that's why the, the, the Feast of Shavuot is very important. One of the purpose of the counting of the Omer is to link the holiday of freedom, like I said, with the holiday of responsibility and our higher purpose. God wants us to, into a higher purpose. Yeah. As freedom is, uh, it, it, without a higher purpose, is not freedom at all. When someone says the purpose of my life is to be free, the next question is free to free for what? Right? You're free to what? Like I said, you know, a person in prison, the, you know, he's he's constantly thinking, okay, uh, you know, two more days, I'm gonna free. And then the next question is, okay, now you're free. Then what? Yeah. Oh yeah. Nobody's gonna feed me anymore. There's no there's no curfew anymore. What am I gonna do now? So so freedom without purpose. He's not freedom at all. Why? Because he has to give, he's going to go back to jail again. Yeah. So the, the God is saying, you know, yes, I set you free. Why? Because how can you serve God if, if, if you are a slave and your master is telling you, no, you, I want you to work on a, on a Shabbat. You're a slave. You, you can't do anything. But God said, okay, I have to free you from all of that. I have to free you from the bondage. Yeah. If you have, if you have a if you're if, if, if a person who is not free, is also they think that he is limited. You know, uh, I'm limited by by my no. God said, "You are unlimited. I've set you free. Even God has set us free. There is no limitation as far if you believe in that God will will will, will do this for you. He will do it for you. Amen. So much is in the framework of the Torah again. Let's yeah. say you know, uh, you know." <laughs> According to his will, according to his will. Amen? So, so here, God is saying, you know, the higher purpose, freedom, with, without the higher purpose, it's not freedom. When someone says, my purpose in life is to be free, free to do what? Freedom is a great blessing, yes. And we have to be grateful that we have it. But freedom is not the purpose or not the goal. That is why we have to link it with purpose. The Omer counting that we did is our preparation to receive the higher purpose that God has in store for us. So what it is to submit to God is not enslavement. Submission to God is the, is the mechanism. Say that is the mechanism, mechanism. for self-actualization, meaning in order for us to emerge 
as what God designed. Remember what God designed you. Huh? Don't bring your car. If, you, if you're driving a Toyota, don't bring it to GM. Because GM did not create your car. They can, they can, they can guess, or maybe this is what it's. But you know, the, the best person to fix your car, the best company to fix your car is the first, the company that made your car. Amen? Amen. Are you still here? Amen. So who made us? God. God. So God knows. He put the ability in there. Amen. He put the talents in there. Amen. He put all, all you need to succeed. Amen? Amen? And we have to come back. When we surrender our life to him, he will, he will make that. Say that. He will make that come out. He will make that do because there are seeds inside of all of us. Amen. That needs to come out. It needs to. It has, it has to be a plant. It has to be a tree. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> and, and and that's what God said. The Torah is your ability. When you submit to God's word, He will allow you. That's why He said, "Cling to the vine." And what happens? The branches will what? Will go. Amen. So, like a musician, you know, like uh, uh, Jesse is an expert in tambourine. And trombone, sorry, some trombone. But before you can be an expert, you need to learn the basics. See that you need to learn the basic. That's why you know it's boring. You need to learn the notes, you need to learn the scales. Are you still with me? Yeah. You have to learn pieces that are boring. See that pieces that are boring. Sometimes our spiritual life is like that. It, you know, we have to start from the basics. But the moment that you master that, see that the moment you master it, you can improvise. That's where the just musician comes out. Why? Because he already knows the do re mi. He knows how to play the do re mi. Now he can he can use that to use creativity. God has given him this talent. But in order for him to enhance that, he has to learn the basics. Yeah, I have to learn the basics. Are you still with me? Yes. Same way with God's word, we need to, to be founded in God's word. So that God can use us to improvise. Amen? Amen. Say wow. 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 So we're going to go to Shabbat before I go crazy. Let's go to go to Shabbat. <laughs> the importance of the feast of Sabbath, the, this is the holy day, and yet many Jews, even Jews today, many even uh, Jews by name and or Jews that are religious, they don't put so much emphasis on Shabbat. Why? Maybe because there is no ritual associated with with the festival. Like Pesach, there's a Seder meal, so so you know, there's 14 days of preparation, so they so there's a lot of uh, rituals around it. Same with Sukkot. Remember, there are three pilgrim festivals, Pesach, Shavuot, and, and Sukkot. But the least popular is Shavuot. So Sukkot, what happens? You prepare a hut. You prepare a sukkah, right? So there's, there's a lot of uh, pre-festival preparation. But yet Shavuot, even though it's one of the three pilgrim feasts, it's actually the most important. See, the most important. The most important. <laughs> and yet the most neglected. Yeah. Why? Because like I said, a lot of people don't understand the Torah. They don't understand what, what happened in Mount Sinai. What, what transpired there? And what I'm going to try to explain it to you today. Uh, I'm not going to read all my notes. I have a lot of notes about Shabbat, but I want you to, to, to grasp the importance of it. So, so, are you still with me? Amen. What time is it? Do we have time? Yes, I still have that. So I can try to, to lay. So, so again, the, the most important, I'm going to explain why it's the most important holiday, and yet it doesn't seem very familiar. Like we, you know, we, we did a count in the Omer, Eliana questioned me, I said, oh, what come you didn't do last year? So now, okay, Eliana, we're going to do it every year now. Yeah, but, yeah. She, but she was challenging me. She finally she reported, why didn't you do it last year? Oh, yeah, good, good point, my daughter. Good point, right? Very good point. But it's very important because it's preparing ourselves. Amen. 
We need to be excited. Yeah, we, need we need to be excited. Be excited. We cannot be lagging behind. Cha cha, we cannot be cha cha. <laughs> Don't be cha cha Asian. Don't be a cha cha Asian, okay? <laughs> cha cha. <laughs> going back and forth. He, he's going nowhere. He's going forward, he's going backward, going nowhere. So what happened? They got chop chop. Okay. So here, for the Jews, the believers are, are not following it. They don't understand it. And yet, I'm telling you, it's the middle. Anything that is in the middle is important. If you're a middle child like me, you're important. <laughs> you have the, 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 the eldest and the youngest, but the, the important person is the middle one, right? <laughs> so same way, same way, say the same way. The Shavuot is the middle piece. Middle. Pesach, freedom. Shavuot purpose, Sukkot, fulfillment. Wow, say wow. wow. Because if you understand your purpose, you can dwell with God in the future. Wow. wow. That's why it's important. So Shavuot is important. 3,300 years ago, it says here the people, of, the Jewish people left Egypt. We left as slaves. We were a nomad group traveling in the desert without a leader or by a leader named Moses. The first stop after the splitting of the Red Sea was where Mount Sinai. 49 days later, when they left, they were gathered or they came there earlier. They came there a week earlier and Moses went up. Moses went up. God called him in the mountain. Go to the next side, Jesse. By the way, why do we drink? Uh, Melanie reminded me. Why do we eat dairy on uh, Shavuot? Why is it? Why is it a tradition? Why? Because if you remember, let me explain it very quickly so that when, when a Jewish person asks you, why do you eat milk? Why do you? Why are you encouraged to eat dairy products on Shavuot? Why? Because remember, when Moses was born, he was born in in Adar seven or Adar seven. He died also in Adar seven. Remember, her mother hid her for three months. Say that you heard hid her for three months. Yeah, remember? And, he, and then when he could not hide her any longer, what did he do? He created an ark and put Moses into the ark. Are you still with me? Yes. And then when she built the ark, what did she do? She asked Miriam, they put him in the river, right? He put Moses in the basket in the river. And you know what day what that, that was? And then what happened? But she, that was Shiva. Uh, uh, the, the queen of the daughter, the Pharaoh's daughter, found her and took her. Okay, and Miriam must said, "Do you want me to find a nursemaid for him?" So that day, see that that day, that happened on Shavuot. See that on Shavuot. And what happened? Moses was given a nursemaid. He was milking on that day. See that Moses was drinking milk that day. Yes. The milk of his mother. Yes. Amen. That's why we remember Moses. We remember to drink milk on Shavuot. Amen. Amen. Why? Because it, it was in Shavuot when that happened. Oh, it was the feast of Shavuot. Of course, Shavuot didn't happen yet, but it was on that day. You see that on that day in God's calendar when Moses was rescued. He was given a second life. Here he was given a second life. Why? Imagine. The, 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 the soldiers could have drowned. Uh, the, the alligators should have eaten him. But God gave him a second life. Say he gave him a second life. So Shabbat is a renewal. Say it's a renewal. Wow. Say it's a renewal. Wow. Okay. So in Exodus chapter, uh, go next slide. So uh, in Exodus chapter 7, it says there, and Moses told the elders and the people and set them before these words, and the Lord commanded him. All the people answered together and said, Well, Moses called the elders of the people and set before them all of the words. God was saying, Are you gonna are you gonna follow my Torah? In verse 8, very interesting. The people of Israel without even knowing what's in it, said, verse 8, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord had spoken, we will do. So, so here, 
Uh, 3,300 years ago, like I said, they gathered in the mountain. Do you want the Torah? Do you want the code by which to live by? Would you like an opportunity that has not been, uh, been uh, presented to mankind? But the, the Talmud says that before it was offered to Israel, the nations were given the opportunity. Do you want, you know, every nation has an angel, ministering angel. And they came to each one of them and said, okay, do you, does their nation uh, like uh, to follow the Torah? He said, what's in it? Oh, there's a provision here about murder. No, we're not interested. And then well, how about here? Well, well, so every nation, every major nation rejected, rejected it. Mm. Why? Say, say that, why? why? I didn't hear you. Say why? why? Because they didn't want to change their ways. Say that, they don't want to change. Want to change. change. Say that, wow. wow. The reason why they rejected it is because they already set in their ways. And they didn't want a code, the, the word of God, to tell them what to do. Wow, sounds familiar, isn't it? Say that. Wow, sounds familiar, isn't it? Isn't that what the people that rejected the Torah is telling? We are no longer under the law. What are you talking about? Yep. <coughs> but, listen, she says, okay, before the world, they, they, they mentioned it, we didn't want it, they didn't want it. I would challenge the stat it would challenge the status quo whether they interpreted the laws of killing and interpreted the laws of stealing. They didn't want to change. The Jewish people responded, we will do and then we will go to learn and explore for the rest of our lives. What is going, what we are going on, what what, what we are going as what doing as ritual. Uh, would become a spiritual practice. So for 3,300 years ago, the question was put, would you like the Torah? Would you like to, to live a, a life with a code of conduct? Something that will be completely changed you from being a group of slaves that you have gone free to a people of purpose. And the people said, yes, please. We will do and we will listen and we will do and we will explore. So, so, uh, so here, so Moses ascends the, the mountain. The deeper learning here of this teaching is that with Moses, he steps his foot on Mount Sinai. And this mountain, all of a sudden, this mountain was not just an ordinary, I think I have a slide next to it. It was not just an ordinary mountain. All of a sudden, remember that what's interesting about Mount Sinai is Mount Sinai was not a very tall mountain. See that not a very tall mountain? It was not the highest mountain like Mount Everest, nor was it the smallest mountain. It was a, it's a, it's a medium-sized mountain. This mountain was, there was no trees. There was no plants. It was bare, right? It was not wide. He had no plants, no vegetation. It was unidentifiable. Hashem says, once you step on it, Moses, you will walk, once you walk that mountain, Moses, I will ensure you no one else can walk on that mountain because it will be temporarily made holy. Like he said, they will literally transport it to Mount Moriah spiritually. We're going to present the people, the Ten Commandments and the whole, the whole Torah. And in Shabbat morning, he said, after three days of preparation, said to prepare yourself for two days. On the third day, again, this is uh, prophetic. He said, prepare yourself for two days or 2,000 years. We're preparing ourselves. And then on the third day, he will come. And that's what Yeshua is coming. He's coming on the third day. In our case, the seventh millennia. After three days of preparation, the people are actually ready. Moses goes up to the mountain on that day. There was a loud, booming voice. This was the voice they heard. A voice that they heard uh, every person. They say every person heard it. It was not like only Sister Lucia who was standing there heard it. Everybody that was there in the mountain, all all two thousand or two million plus of them, maybe three million. We don't know the estimate. Three million people were standing there. Everyone heard it. Say everyone heard it. Everyone heard it. It's not like a prophet saying, "Okay, 
I had a dream last night. You know, God, uh, this prophet came into my room and told me this. No, it, this is not. This is not a second hand. This is first hand knowledge. Amen? Amen. So what happened is the people, when uh, millions of people who gathered 3,300 years ago, witnessed men, women, and children were all present. Their soul and body were conscious of what was going on. They were not dreaming. They were not sleeping. When they heard the booming voice, it was a different the voice they heard, the, uh, there was no echo, the, the words of Hashem. I said, I am Hashem, your God. I'm the Lord that you took you out of Egypt. I'm the Lord that, that uh, what? took you out of Egypt and established you. So the first commandment, I took you out of Egypt. There was no intermediary. There was no one else. I am your creator. I'm your redeemer. And then number two, you should not have any other gods at this point. The Jewish people began to scream and said, Moses, Moses, tell God to stop talking. Why? What, what's happening is, as they were standing there, as God was talking, as when God was speaking, their soul literally left their body. And they died. And then when God stopped speaking, the, the, the soul went back. They were resurrected. They, they stood again, and then they heard the word of God again, and their, 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 their soul left their body again. And then and then it came back. So they, they said they could not take it anymore. Why? Because the, the holiness of God, our physical body, that's why we need a new body. Yeshua said he will give us a new body. Why? Because our physical body today is not able to stand even the voice of God. Literally, you know, the voice, their, their soul left their body. You are soul. Yes, their soul in that. The body is the heart. Yeah, the, 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 and then they died. They, the, the, the body fell, and then the soul went back again. And, and they also, resurrected. Also, Moshe, when he went into the Mount, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Mount Sinai was like a gateway. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Elohim had come down and opened, and, and they say that Moshe actually went into heaven. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And he was in heaven. And it means. With God. So yes. it's, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. So so that's why they, they said no, we don't want to hear anymore. It's not, not because they didn't want to hear God, but it was just too much for their for their physical being, the, the, the way they are. Huh? Yes, but they heard it, they heard it, they heard it very clearly in their own language. Their own language. What the, what God was saying, I'm the I'm the one who delivered you. That's the first commandment. So when they were they were in the desert, they were in the desert receiving the Torah in a desolate place. You know, they, it's interesting because God did not give the Torah in, in Israel. He gave it in the wilderness. The wilderness is no man's land. Nobody owns it. In other words, what God is saying, the Torah is for everyone. Say that for everyone. For everyone. everyone. Not just the Jewish people thinking, oh, it's only a Jewish. No, it's for everyone that whomsoever, say whomsoever, whomsoever. wants to covenant himself or herself with the God of his, the God of creation, the God of Israel. Then you, 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 you this Torah is for you. Amen? Yeah, but you have to convert. You have to, you know, become a convert to Judaism if you're going to receive and obey the Torah. You cannot stay in paganism. Oh yes, yes. That goes without saying because we we, we well, people ourselves. don't understand that. Yeah, we don't. We don't people understand that. Yeah, yeah, we we cannot um, remain a pagan like the, yeah. what we're gonna see later on uh, uh, the, the story of Ruth uh, uh, and Orpha and uh, the the, the, the beautiful Orpha. depiction of Ruth and Orpha here. So yeah. well, why don't we go there? Because I think we, I don't have much we're time. time. Yeah. We don't have much time, but. Um, Understand that. Wait, wait, before I go there, but, but you need to understand that what, ha what, what happened there in Mount Sinai, what happened there is that uh, so what, 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 what we need to understand is that, that this is the first time that really God appeared before the entire nation, before the world, and declared himself. So there was a there was a a, a change that happened. 
the things that happen is, you know, all of a sudden now we have, because remember when, when he said, I Anuki, he said, I am God, I wrote myself down in the scroll. So what God is saying, now you have the word of God written here on the earth now. It used to just be the, the word was only in heaven. Now the word is on earth. So there, so therefore there's a there's a tremendous energy. There's a tremendous uh, if you if you if you if you understand that spiritually, the word of God is is Him manifesting. If we if we read it, if we study, if we live it, you are really manifesting the glory of God in your life. Amen. So that's that's the whole message there. You know. Uh, uh, so. In, uh, in in let's go to let's go to Esther. I mean to uh, Ruth and to uh, the famous speech of uh, let's skip skip all that. So uh, so Ruth and Ruth and Orpha. So if you know the story, go to the next slide. The the the, the story of Ruth and Orpha. So uh, Eli Melek, he's a uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. he was a. Uh, if you, if you understand, why do we read the story of Ruth and uh, the story, the book of Ruth on Shavuot? Why? Uh, if you remember, Eli Melek, he's a, uh, he is uh, of the, yes, he's of the, uh, of, of the, the, the tribe of David. And uh, his name means God our King. But he was a, he was a prominent leader during the time of Israel when they had a famine. It's a, this is during the time of the judges. This is before the, the time of the kings. So there was a judgment that happened. They, uh, there was a famine in the land. And what did Eli Melech do? He, he, he's the, understand that he was a leader, right? Say that he was a leader. And due to the famine, he went with his wife and his two sons to the land of Moab, or which is today Jordan. Yep. And what happened? The story in the Jewish people, they, they, they started, uh, started out with Eli Melech, followed God, their kings. And then what happened? Soon after that, there was a, they marry, uh, they meet, uh, uh, they, they said that uh, Ruth and Orpha are sisters. They are children of the king of the Moabites, or some of them say they, they are from royal descent as well. But so remember, before uh, for them to marry the sons of, uh, of uh, Elimelech, they had to convert. So both women had to convert. Otherwise, their marriage will not be recognized. So they had to convert. So both converted. And the story goes that. Uh, Elimelech died, and, the, and soon the, the two sons, Malkon and Kilion, died as well. So, so the story goes that Naomi decides that there is no more, there's no more uh, reason for her to stay in uh, the land of Moabite. So she decides to return, and then she tells Ruth and Orpha, "Why don't you go back to your father's house?" Because there's nothing left for me to you. I cannot have children anymore. But you, you see the famous speech there of Ruth that uh, she cleaved to, to Naomi. So here we have a picture of, you know, very painful story. But if you compare, you know, uh, uh, the story of uh, Ruth and Orpha, it's like, you know, they, they started out uh, with, with, they started out at, uh, the Jews, they, they converted, and then one of them went back to her pagan ways, and Ruth remained as a convert. So it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like what happened is here is a, a Moabite woman, her husband dies, Naomi sends her off, and she refuses. Her other sister leaves her, but Ruth clings to her. Naomi decides to go back. What happened here after the death of, in, in the ascension of the Messiah? What did happen? The Jews and the Gentiles created a messianic congregation. But later, there was a fraction, Ruth and Orpha. Ruth grafted Gentile, clung to her Jewish roots. Example here today. They, why? 
they were they were they were curious they were hungry to know the truth or are you an orpha who, who was who has been exposed to the god of israel and decided to go back to her pagan ways amen so with that with that jesse are you ready so with that we're going to uh conclude today we're going to continue the story of shabuot uh, next next time but the unique gift and talents are welcome and celebrated hashem hashem called each and one each one of us and we have a place in his kingdom Esther. Shavuot reminds us of our purpose and calling. This was reaffirmed when the Ruach HaKodesh was poured out to Yeshua, Yeshua's disciple. Are you going to be a root or an orphan today? Let us pray. Father, we thank you today. Father, we thank you. It's uh, the eve, um, the feast of Shavuot. And as you are um, telling us, it's a, the more important feast. Why? Because it, uh, it is the purpose of why you call each one of us from freedom to purpose. And Father, we're here to celebrate the giving of your word, the word Yeshua, the living word. May the living word live in our hearts, the hearts of your people today. Let it not be a document. Let it not be a tablet. Let it be engraved in the hearts of your people today. Your Torah, your word, your instruction is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, I just lift up every family today, every household. Father, you you heard the cries of your people. Father, you know all the needs. Father, we, we surrender it all to you. We lift up every family today, every household. And Father, we thank you that you are able. And we allow you, Father, allow you to bless us, Father. Bless us indeed. And enlarge our territory. Yeah. In Yeshua the Messiah. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Amen.